we would like to be able to unload kernel modules every now and then, for example, during development or um, for whatever reason. Uh, and device drivers affect an even wider range of um, legacy uh, code in, in existence. So it's even harder to change anything about the device driver API in that BSD um, that affects all the network drivers and everything else as well. Another kind of resource is uh, file system objects, uh, specifically uh, the um, kernel representation of um, cached files called vnodes. I won't address uh, file system objects all that much um, in, in this talk because the system that we have uh, is um, not terribly interesting, but uh, the main the main uh, uh, I will be uh, network groups and device drivers as sort of two extreme examples. Network groups having there have been there may be tens of thousands of them, and device drivers only a few dozen, um, with slightly different uh, requirements on the APIs. Uh, another kind of user credential sets. Um, uh, they might be copying for the process and so on. Um, so a resource in the kernel will have um, uh, uh, many, will, will come in a few different stages. Uh, when you create a resource, for instance, when you uh, create a network group, before any part of the system that is processing packets is aware of that network group, um, you need to initialize some data structure for the root, and then you need to publish it in the rooting table so that all of the threads uh, rooting packets can find that root. Next, once a resource has been published, uh, many different threads uh, may try to acquire it, use it, and then release it. And when a thread has acquired a resource, um, it is guaranteed that that resource will not be taken away by some other thread. Um, conversely, uh, as long as there are any threads that have acquired some resource, um, uh, a process that's trying to, say, delete a network root or unload a device driver cannot do so. It is blocked until all the users are complete. Um, and then once all the users are no longer using the resource, the memory for a network root can be freed safely. So, if you're designing an API for some kind of resource like network groups or device drivers, um, you need to make sure that nobody uh, can free memory that is still in use. Uh, obvious bugs there, security problems, the kernel will crash, and you split it, don't do it. Uh, and there may be other API contracts that are involved, such as rules for how to use um, mutex locks. I'll address one of those in, in that shortly. Um, and I then you may want to you enable concurrent uses of resources. You may be concerned about performance. Maybe not. Um, for some device drivers that can manage a few resources where performance isn't important, performance is not important. So, um, here's a prototypical example of a resource, um, a foo. Uh, it has uh, some key. Uh, that is, for instance, the uh, um, destination uh, range, uh, the, the, um, the destination network of some network group. Uh, there's some associated data, such as the next hop or something for a root, and then uh, uh, a little bit of um, uh, uh, an extra record to store this in a linked list of all the foods in a system. Um, there is there might be one uh, table of uh, foos, uh, just one giant linked list of foos, uh, with a lock to protect it so that multiple threads can look out foos, and the first one in the linked list. Um, to create and publish a foo, we allocate some memory for it with the key in question, uh, then we set up the next pointer of that foo and insert it into the linked list under the lock, and uh, the mutex ensures that only one thread at a time can ever be using foo tab, the foo tab lock, the foo table lock. Um, to look it up, require the lock, walk through the linked list. If we find a match, then we use the foo that we found, and we exit. Now, all of this happens while the lock is held. Um, so again, there can be only one thread using uh, any foo at any given time. Uh, to delete, we just uh, delete and destroy, we just delete it from the list under the lock, so again, nobody can be using the foos this time, and once we found it and uh, 
detached it from the list, delete it from the list, then we can free it. So this, this may work for your application, um, but this has no parallelism whatsoever. It may be multiprocessor safe, MP safe, but it's not multiprocessor scalable. It doesn't scale to multiple CPUs. Using more CPU doesn't help you. Also, uh, there are limitations on what you can do in NetBSD while you hold a mutex lock, because mutex enter has no way to be interrupted. So we have a rule that uh, while you're holding a lock, you can't just you know, do long computations or wait for I.O. indefinitely or anything like that. So there are limitations in what you can do on, while, while the lock is held. Um, so to uh, um, uh, allow you to do a little more uh, while um, uh, while you a little more with a resource, um, for instance, if you need to do I.O. on some device directly, on some device, hardware device or something, um, and to allow multiple users to be using a um, a foo at, at, at the same time, uh, we can give each each foo a reference count, um, add another, another integer field to uh, the foo, and create a um, condition variable for notifying a thread that's, that wants to destroy a foo uh, that uh, we're done using it. So here's the uh, layout of memory. Um, we've got a, the head of the list. Uh, the mutex is currently unowned. Nobody is bolting it right now. There's nobody waiting to destroy a foo, and just from a link list here, we see the reference count. Um, initialization, creation, and publication, same thing as we initialize reference count to zero. Nobody holds reference yet. Uh, to look up and acquire a reference to the resource, well, um, we first uh, lock the table, so nobody can modify the table uh, during, in, in, during this section. Then go through the, uh, walk through the linked list, and find one, increment the reference count to indicate that this food is in use, and then exit, release the table lock, and now, if we found a foo, we can use it, and anybody else at the same time can also look up more foos and use those more foos. Um, so we, we enable some parallelism here, um, although the amount of parallelism we get will be limited uh, for the reasons to be shown in a moment. And to release it, uh, we acquire the block again, uh, decrement the reference count, and if it went down to zero, notify anybody who might have been interested to know that the reference count is zero. Someone is trying to destroy the thread, destroy the, the food. Um, so to destroy, we uh, again do a lookup, um, delete it from, uh, delete the foo from the list, and then wait for the reference, reference count to go to zero. So anybody who has any thread that has already acquired a reference, um, uh, we wait for them to finish and, and release it before we finally uh, free uh, the memory for, for the food. So, uh, this idiom is easy to write, it's easy to prove correct, you're never, you're, it's easy to prove you will never try to you know, use memory after you've freed it, and um, if that works for your application, then it's, it's great. Um, you can go to another talk and, and listen, listen to something else. Um, but it does have some problems. Um, there can be only one lookup at any given time. Now, if you have a single linked list for all your you know, tens of thousands of network routes, obviously, well, first of all, you don't want to use a single linked list for that. But if for some reason you, you look up took a long time, then there, there's no parallelism for lookups. So adding more CPUs doesn't help you to do lots of lookups in parallel. Also, there is contention over the global ta foo table lock for every single object in the table. Um, so every time you want to release a foo, uh, even if you don't have to wake anyone yet because if the, the same foo is still in use by many other users, you have to take a global table lock and that blocks any lookup, etc. So uh, all this means this idiom isn't really very scalable to many CPUs unless the operations that you're doing with the foos are, uh, take a long time and uh, you, you don't actually acquire and release foos very often, like file system operations, for instance doing <coughs> disk, while you hold on the whole their uh, references. So when I invent the SDV node, uh, reference counts are basically done like this. So um, maybe we can address the uh, contention over the lock for any object. 
that is uh, address the problem that to release an object, you need to uh, uh, um, uh, you need you need to uh, uh, block all lookups as well. So we could partition all the foos into uh, buckets using a random function, um, and if if uh, the distribution of how, much, how often each thread wants to use each foo is basically uniform across the foos, across the resources. Yeah, this, this helps. Um, so instead of a single linked list of uh, the resources, we create an array of uh, lists. Um, same data structures here, same lock, same condition variable, except one per different hash value. Uh, and then we add a little padding to make sure that uh, this doesn't, um, uh, just, we, we don't share it, but we don't have the same, we don't use the same cache line for two different uh, buckets. Um, then that's just the same, that's, that's intention right there. Uh, intention is on the cache line granularity. Um, to do a lookup, we just first hash the key, and instead of using the global uh, list, I, um, we go through the uh, uh, list for the hash. Straightforward. Um, but this relies on the distribution of resource use being uniform. Uh, every, every, the, the, the threads have to want each foo just about as often. If you have a lot of network flows that all go to the same destination, that doesn't hold. Everyone's trying to use the same route. So um, we need to address that for many applications. Uh, and also, um, uh, there's still only one lookup at any given time, because there's a global lock of this. And, uh, there's still contention for releasing resources. So let's still have to take a uh, not well, okay, not one global lock, but one one per hash. Um, so one way to address the uh, 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 cost of contention of releasing resources is to use atomic operations. Um, and so if, if three threads hold it, hold a resource, and one thread is trying to destroy it, when one of the three threads releases the resource, it doesn't have to notify the destroyer because there are two more threads that have to release it before. It. Before you're allowed to free it. So um, instead of uh, using just uh, ref times plus plus, we can use an atomic operation um, here. And then uh, to delete, this is to release, we do a little dance to um, uh, notify or to uh, decrement the reference count from one that is referenced to zero, unreferenced, only under the lock, so that we can safely notify. Uh, whoever is trying to destroy it. Otherwise, these atomic operations and the rest of this is just a standard atomic uh, atomic decrement written out within the parent swap. However, atomics are still not scalable themselves. Um, there is, you know, a, a lot of those data structures with atomic operations have been very fashionable for a long time. Um, but again, when many threads want to use the same resource and want to increment and decrement the same reference count. Um, they still have to contend over the same cache line. So atomic operation is not just some magic bullet that, um, uh, that lets you uh, scale in parallel uh, better than, than a lot of it. A single atomic operation is a little bit faster than a mutex operation and uses a little less memory, but that's about it. Um, mutexes are just an atomic on some you know, order uh, pointer. Um, in particular, if, if, uh, if one CPU decides it wants to um, uh, increment reference count, and then another CPU does the same thing. The second CPU has to send a message over the system bus to all other CPUs in the system because each CPU doesn't know which one owns the cache line right now. It has to send a message to all of them to find it find out. Um, and so the cost of this scales with the number of CPUs. Now, you could arrange this uh, the CPUs in a hierarchy to make it logarithmic instead of linear and so on, but the, the, the point is you're, you have to have um, non trivial communication between the CPUs for atomics. And you, you could also use reader writer locks instead of hash locks, um, but a, a reader count. Uh, um, yeah, so this this helps you to uh, allow, allow many lookups in parallel. Um, but if lookups are fast, then reader count is just another kind of reference count. And so if there's another atomic going on inside a reader writer lock. So this doesn't really tell you anything. The basic problem is that. Um, when multiple threads want to use a single resource, everything we've I've discussed so far involves writing to memory associated with that resource. And the CPUs all have to agree on what memory gets written. So uh, maybe we can avoid 
writing to the resource, if we just want to read something out of it, like if we just want to find the next hop for a network route, we don't need to write to other CPUs, we don't need to communicate with them, we just need to know what's the next hop, we just need to read this memory and make sure the route doesn't go away before, before I'm done. So, in NetBSD, uh, we provide uh, several uh, abstractions uh, for um, acquiring and releasing references with zero contention between CPUs. Um, that is, you don't have to, if you're using, a, if you're acquiring a resource, you don't have to write anything to memory that any other CPUs might be writing to. Um, uh, two of them are currently in NetBSD, one of them is in development, it's on a branch. Um, so we, we had passive serialization for a few years. Um, last year we introduced passive references, maybe two years ago now, and local accounts are in development. So passive serialization is similar to read copy update, uh, which you may know from Linux, uh, or you may have heard of from Linux. Um, passive serialization specifically is slightly different uh, and is covered by a US patent that expired several years before the RCU patent expired, which uh, made it uh, much more, uh, um, much less legally dangerous to use passive serialization than RCU. Uh, passive references are similar to hazard pointers, if you've heard of those, um, or to the OpenBSD SRP uh, mechanism. Um, passive references are a little bit simpler than either of those, and they're easier to use, I think. Um, I'm not sure how the performance errors <laughs> uh, expect is pretty similar. Um, local counts are just in um, giving, uh, instead of using one global reference count, it's to give each CPU its own local reference count for every object. Um, and it's uh, similar to sleepable RCU, um, which I'm not sure it's in Linux right now, but it's been discussed by the various Linux people for a long time. <coughs> Um, and again, it's a little bit simpler than FRCU. Uh, I haven't fully understood uh, why FRCU is so complicated, but it, it's pretty similar. So, um, if we have a lot of readers happening at the same time, uh, it's fairly easy to coordinate a uh, publishing a new resource in, say, a linked list or radix tree or their uh, hash table with the readers. Um, we just have to make sure that the uh, publisher and the user uh, read and write memory in the correct order so that uh, the publisher doesn't, or the reader doesn't read a pointer that is pointing to garbage uh, and, uh, and the publisher doesn't uh, publish memory before it's initialized what it, what it points to. Um, so this, is, uh, this will work with one writer and any number of readers uh, concurrently and um, it, it works with uh, hash tables or radio screens. So uh, the idea is to uh, First, uh, initialize memory, so we initialize the foo, and we initialize the next pointer of the foo struct. And we make sure that all of the above writes have happened before we expose the pointer to the foo to any other CPUs. Um, so this is, the, this is the publisher. And uh, okay, so, uh, the publisher, if it has already written, um, so, uh, up, here, uh, up top is the existing list uh, before inserting anything into it. Publisher initializes a new structure and uh, makes the next pointer point to the next uh, element of the list. Uh, the dotted lines uh, represent data that have not yet necessarily been published to other CPUs. They may be stuck in a write queue, for example. Next, uh, the publisher issues a memory barrier. So at this point, after the memory barrier, everything the publisher has just written is now potentially visible to other CPUs. Finally, uh, once all the data are uh, visible to other CPUs, we change the next pointer of the previous element to point to the new one. Now, the dotted lines indicate, uh, again, that this write may not be visible to other CPUs yet, but that's okay. It doesn't really matter how long it takes. Um, eventually, the, uh, this will be uh, uh, exposed to other CPUs, and only one publisher at any given time can operate uh, because uh, it's all under a new text box. So it's globally serialized. The, the publisher is globally serialized. Similarly, the reader, um, uh, if it just uh, reads the pointer first, and then makes sure it has uh, uh, um, it, 
uh, any anything that is read afterward is actually read afresh. That is, it actually issues a new uh, sends a new uh, read request to memory. Um, then uh, uh, the, the the reader is guaranteed that it will see the data in the foo um, that the publisher intended to publish, and not just garbage that was there before the publisher published it. Um, so in in principle, uh, it's a little counterintuitive that um, uh, you. You can read a pointer to something that was written after the, what it points to was initialized, and then read garbage from that. Um, and it's actually only on DEC Alpha CPUs that this can happen, uh, of any CPUs that I'm aware of. Um, on all of the CPUs that I'm aware of, uh, uh, data-dependent reads um, are, are never reordered. But in principle, this, the, the CPU could, could have cached uh, the location of the key and the data in memory um, uh, before reading the pointer to it, uh, and then you have a scale cache value. So on most CPUs, memory data that consumer does nothing, so no, no cost at all. So uh, from the reader's perspective, uh, the dotted lines here indicate um, uh, locations in memory that have not yet been read in this lookup operation. But it shows what the reader would read if it dereferenced the, the pointer to that. So initially, um, the reader might read garbage from the, uh, uh, from the from the foo struct and garbage that points off into oblivion somewhere, somewhere we don't want to go. Uh, then the uh, reader issues the uh, read barrier, and now if so, the reader hasn't it hasn't actually read uh, these these uh, data in memory yet. But if the reader did read them, these are the values it would see, including the pointer to the legitimate next uh, entry. Then we can read the data in the foo struct and proceed on a merry way. Uh, deletion is even easier. One line, just set the previous point. Well, you have to find where to put it, but just set the previous pointer. Um, uh, so if we have uh, uh, the length as, as it was, then we just change. Uh, that's it. Um, but there is a catch here. Uh, I have mentioned deletion, but not destruction. Um, so this works with publication and use of a resource. And deletion of the resource from the table, um, but it doesn't let the uh, let any thread know when it's safe to destroy the memory, when it's safe to free the memory. So we need some kind of signal for when it, for when users are done with the resource, um, and we need to signal that without requiring users to write to share memory, because that's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid having to write to memory in order to read from it. So with passive serialization, um, the way we do this is we first, uh, in, in when we're acquiring a reference, we're looking up a, a, a resource to use it, we first block interrupts in the CPU. Now, that may strike you as a little bit out of left field, but um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see why in a moment. Um, so then we look up the resource, we use it, um, and we restore and process queued interrupts once, once, we, once we're done using the resource. You can't use the resource after, after we uh, process queued interrupts. Now, the reason that we're blocking interrupts is that to destroy a resource, uh, we first remove, remove it from the list, so no more, no new users can acquire references. And this is a common theme. First, prevent new references from appearing. Then, wait for existing references to drain, and then we're creating safe to destroy it. So, next, we send an interprocessor interrupt or a cross call to all CPUs. When each CPU calls up all the other ones and says, hey, please execute some code, execute some code, execute some code. Um, in fact, it says execute nothing, basically. Just, just do something, do, well, do nothing, but just, you know, execute some code that does nothing. And then the destroyer waits for it to return on all CPUs. Now, the key point is, if anyone, if any CPU is using a resource right now, the interprocessor interrupt is blocked. So doing nothing has to wait, and wait until the resource is done being used, and can then be, then, then be released. Um, so all the users uh, that could have seen the resource that was just deleted um, are, done, are guaranteed to be done with it once the interprocessor interrupt returns on all CPUs, or returns from all CPUs. Here's a little diagram. Uh, CPU B is trying to uh, unlink, or, or sorry, trying to destroy a resource. CPU, CPUs A and C are trying to use resources. 
Um, so ZPU A enters a read section, uh, ZPU C enters a read section, and ZPU B removes a resource from the table. At this point, it may still be in use. CPUs A and, B, A and C are still using it. Um, then CPU B sends an IPI, interprocessor interrupt, to all CPUs in the system, saying, do nothing, just tell me when you're, when, when you're, in, when you're processing interrupts again. CPU C has already uh, exited the read section, so IPIs or interrupts are enabled again, answers immediately. CPU A is still in the middle of the read section, so the IPI processing is deferred until the read section ends. Now at this point, CPU C enters a new read section, but CPU C is guaranteed not to see the resource that B is trying to destroy because B just unlinked it, just removed it from the table. So C will never see that resource again. Finally, um, a, uh, CPU A uh, finishes the read section and uh, then processes queued interrupts and answers the IPI. And once it answers, CPU B knows that the resource is safe to destroy. Um, so uh, the code for uh, passive serialized uh, uh, lookup and DUC is almost the same as what I sketched earlier with uh, the uh, coordinated publisher of reader. The only difference is you have to start by entering a read section and returning the current interrupt mask, and then end by exiting the read section, uh, restoring the interrupt mask and processing the uh, interrupt. This next. So you can put a PCRLED read section inside a PCRLED read section. Um, the interrupt will just be deferred until the end of the very last one. To delete, um, we look up the entry. Uh, we first prevent new users by um, removing the uh, resource in question from the list. Then we call PCRLED perform to send the IPI to all CPUs and wait for it to return. And at that point, we're guaranteed no other CPUs are using this resource. So prevent new users, wait for old users to finish, and then it's finally safe to destroy, safe to, safe to free the food. Free the foods. Uh, to facilitate the uh, memory barriers that you need to add, because uh, here for read, you need the membar data to consumer, data dependent read barrier, and for insert, uh, I didn't put that because the same as up. Um, but you um, need to have a uh, uh, write before write barrier or a memoir producer. Um, so uh, in order to make uh, managing the linked list easier, we added some macros, kind of like the um, uh, uh, sys slash q macros, um, because sys slash q macros do not have the correct memory barriers, and they need to go inside, because you need to first initialize a new entry for a linked list, and then set the previous entry. Um, so it has to go inside the, the list operation. So we provided a PS list. Um, it is just like list, but it has the right memory barriers for um, passive uh, passive visualization. It's got constant time to insert and delete, and the direct memory barriers for insert uh, and delete. Uh, so uh, the code for uh, doing the lookup um, uh, or insertion or lookup you know, looks like this. Right, well, first, then we have uh, instead of the next pointer, we have struct PS list entry inside of foo and a start PS list head inside the food table, and just PS list write or insert head instead of setting the next and previous pointers themselves, and then PS list reader for each. These both, this inserts the right memoir producer, this inserts the right memoir data net consumer. Um, so, passive serialization is great because zero contention, completely uh, for, for readers. Um, they, there's, there can still be only one writer and only one destroyer in the given time but zero contention for readers. You don't have to write anything to read. Um, the uh, read sections are also fast. All you have to do is block interrupts on the current CPU. You don't have to do anything else. And it's not hardware interrupts. Um, we just use software interrupts. Uh, so this is really just setting a flag in the current uh, thread pointer, the current, uh, yeah, the, the current thread uh, record. You don't have to re reconfigure your hardware type controllers. Um, the overhead of using PCRLIs is constant. There is zero overhead for each resource, each food, each network route, each device driver, whatever, uh, and no memory overhead for CPU. So it's great, it's really cheap. Um, but it's limited. You have to block interrupts uh, for uh, uh, the entire read section. 
and you can't sleep, you can't do I.O., you can't wait for I.O., you can't uh, you know, pause, you, 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 can't do any, you can't do long computations, really, it's bad idea to do long computations. So, um, what you can do inside a piece of early read section is limited. Um, so, if we want to piece of as a network stack, well, and the code is written in the 80s before parallelism mattered, and Sometimes the packet processing path has to allocate memory. Um, for example, to prepend uh, a header to a packet in a tunnel. Um, and we can't just redo the whole thing in one swell foop. Um, so maybe we can do it incrementally with slightly different trade-offs. We won't get quite the same pros as we had, but maybe we can have fewer cons uh, that uh, interfere with reengineering the network stack. So with passive references, instead of just using uh, blocking interrupts as the mechanism for determining that uh, resources are in use, we have each CPU just write down a list. These are the resources I'm using. The other CPU writes down a list. These are the I'm using. The I'm using. And uh, then when um, you want to do a lookup, use pserialized uh, read sections because your hash table lookups with pserialized are great. Um, to acquire a resource, uh, you just write it down on, on your local you know, CPU local list. And you can do anything you want on that CPU. Um, you can sleep while you're holding the resource, because as long as you stay on that CPU, you, the resources you're using are still listed, so they're not going to go away. Um, you can you know, eat, watch television. Um, and to release the resource, uh, you simply cross it off the list of the resources you're using. Um, and finally, uh, when someone wants to destroy a resource, this is the expensive operation. We assume that destroying resources is infrequent, uh, much less frequent than using them. And uh, so instead of just sending an IP that does nothing, we go, th go through and send an IP that checks all the list of resources. And um, if the resource that you're trying to destroy is on any list, then you can't destroy it yet. Gotta wait. Um, but there is one small constraint here, which is that when you're using resources, like when you're forwarding packets, uh, you can't switch CPUs because the list of resources is per CPU. Um, so the API uh, looks pretty similar to, um, uh, well, it, it, it requires some small changes from my uh, uh, serialization. So we just add a psref target uh, uh, field to each resource. This is going to be um, uh, there's just actually the one flag that says whether the resource is being destroyed or not. Then all these are targeted in. Insert as you would be serialized. Um, to acquire it, first we bind to the current CPU. So we make sure that the current thread does not switch CPUs. No thread migration, no CPU migration for the thread. Do a pserialized lookup, and all that we do to use the resource under the pserialized lookup is to do a passive reference acquisition, do a PS ref acquire. Um, that puts, uh, we, well, so we allocated a little record on the stack for uh, our reference. PSREF Replier just puts that uh, record in the stack onto the current CPU's list of resources in use. Uh, then we exit the base <coughs> section, and now we can use it down here. To uh, release the resource, um, we just do PSREF release, which uh, takes uh, our reference off the stack. Uh, sorry, off the, the per CPU list. Uh, and if there is anyone trying to destroy the resource, it notifies that, uh, that party, notifies that thread. And then finally, we uh, restore whether or not we were bound on, on to the current CPU. Again, no uh, atomic operations if, uh, uh, as, as long as nobody is, as long as no threads are trying to destroy the resource. Um, to destroy a resource, uh, we call psref target destroy, which uh, writes a flag telling psref uh, release that someone wants to destroy this resource. Someone wants to delete this network route. Someone wants to unload this device driver. Um, so the future psref release will wake it. Then psref target destroy goes, sends an IPI to every CPU and checks is it on the uh, CPU's list. If so, all right, I'll wait and let PSF release notify me. Or in case there is a wake up missed, because um, we don't, we we're trying to avoid interlocking here. PSF target destroy periodically wakes up like every millisecond or something. <coughs> so, 
Um, the pattern, once again, is we prevent new users uh, from uh, getting at the uh, resource. Then, uh, using uh, just the pserialize uh, uh, itself, um, uh, I think we just you know, look up uh, the entry in the list, if we found it, and remove it from the list, wait for all existing users of the list entry to complete, that is, all lookups that are happening right now. Then wait for all the old users to uh, drain using PSR target destroy. And finally, once that has returned, there is nobody else using the resource in the system, so we can free it safely. Um, so a few notes on password references. Uh, threads can sleep while you hold them. Um, so that means we don't need to uh, dramatically re-engineer the whole network stack to avoid sleeping in the packet processing path. We should, we should do that engineering to make it avoid sleeping in the, in the processing, packet processing path. But we don't have to in order to make some progress for parallelization. Um, binding to one CPU uh, is usually not a problem because a lot of the network stack already runs on a single CPU anyway. That is, a lot of the network processing happens on whatever CPU it started on. It never switches. And processing a packet is usually a short operation, so it's OK if it, if it can't migrate between CPUs. Um, as a bonus, because we have a uh, record of um, a list of the resources in use, we can write assertions for diagnostics, which has been very helpful for debugging. Um, I'm sure Nakahara-san and uh, Ozaki-san have, uh, have used this a lot. Um, the memory cost is pretty modest. There's uh, one list per CPU, uh, one, um, uh, 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 one flag per resource, one bit per resource, byte or more per resource, and we need a uh, list entry for each, uh, uh, um, each reference that any thread has. Um, so, Again, with uh, you know, network routes, there are tens of thousands of uh, routes in the system, so I, well, one extra byte per route, it's not so bad. Um, they already, they already you know, probably fill a cache line, I expect, uh, or you know, just about fill a cache line. Um, uh, and there are usually only a handful of them you know, on any CPU at a time. That is, you don't acquire references to 10,000 network routes all at once to forward a single packet just pick up one route, or maybe a couple, like a, you know, a tunnel and a route, or something like that. To um, now, another mechanism, uh, if I still have time here, uh, is how much time do I have? Um, like, uh, okay, well, then, um, not much to say about local counts, uh, but the basic idea is just to per CPU uh, reference count. Um, has a much higher memory cost because you need one reference, one count per CPU per resource. So it's the product of the, the CPU resources. So you don't want to use this for things with um, uh, a lot of, of which there are many. So device drivers, a few dozen. Network routes, tens of thousands. Don't use local counts for network routes. Um, uh, the usage looks pretty similar. Um, instead of PSR target net, local count net. Um, Wire, release, uh, is notes on how it works. Um, uh, usage, again, looks very similar to passive references. We, um, in fact, the first, the top part is identical. The only difference is we use local count destroy instead of um, PS rep destroy. Um, this is still experimental. Uh, we are planning to use it for device drivers to make them safely unloadable. Um, and we'll probably find other applications as well. So, uh, in summary, we want to avoid uh, locks because locks don't scale. Um, if, if necessary, you can you know split things up with hash locking schemes. But uh, if you can do things without locks, uh, then uh, all the better. And atomics are not much different from locks. Um, there are some purposes for which they are a little bit cheaper, a little less memory, very slightly faster, but otherwise basically the same thing. Um, passive serialize or deserialize for short, uninterruptible reads. It's very fast, but uh, it's limited. You can't use it, you can't sleep. Um, PS ref, past references, you can, you can sleep. Um, it's, there's a modest time memory cost, and it's pretty flexible. It's mostly a drop-in replacement for uh, reader-writer locks. Um, local count, similar thing. Uh, re the, the readers can uh, migrate from CPU to CPU, though. Um, 
it's it's you know, fast, or serially a little faster than fast references, but uh, very memory intensive, so can't use it for um, uh, resources that uh, of which there are very many. So, any questions? All right, I guess that means I talk too fast because I always talk too fast. <laughs> Well, if, uh, if any of you folks have uh, any questions about any of these things, passive references, uh, passive realization, uh, or any, anything else in that, you can feel free to send me an email uh, and talk to me offline here. Uh, I am always uh, happy to answer questions about how things work. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed the, the conference and this, uh, this last uh, paper session here. Thank you.